Good morning, good afternoon, good evening everyone. Welcome to this uh, Pelago webinar. Today the focus will be on SETSA Explore, our mass spectrometry unbiased method for compound profiling and target identification. Uh, so my name is Jakub, I'm an operational manager here at uh, Pelago Bioscience in sales and marketing. And uh, together with me in our uh, little Swedish studio, I have a couple of our presenters also with our keynote speaker joining us virtually. But before I present them, I just wanted to welcome you um, and uh, tell you that the topic of today will be Sets Explore, a mass spectrometry approach for Tiger ID and compound profiling. Uh, little housekeeping for the webinar. It will take one hour with a short Q&A session towards the uh, end of, of the webinar. So our speakers today will be, first of all, Gizem Akchai. She received her PhD in chemistry uh, at Tufts University. Then she continues with her training at MIT and followed that with postdoctoral, postdoctoral appointment at Astra. Zeneca R&D site at Waltham, USA. In her current role as a head of chemical biology at Bayer Research and Innovation Center, she and her team supports early research development through technology platforms focusing on phenotypic screens, target deconvolution, chemoproteomics, and new modalities for drug discovery. Tonight, she will give a talk titled SETSA Enable the Convolution of Cellular Targets from a High Throughput Phenotypic Screens. Our next presenter is uh, also Thomas Freeman joining us here uh, live. He is working as a senior scientist here at Pelago Bioscience at the Explore Unit. He received his PhD at Uppsala University in uh, Sweden in medical sciences. Then he did, did postdoc training at Sanford Burnham Medical Institute and also Karolinska Institute. Uh, the title of his talk is Sets Explore Profiling of Histone Deacetylases inhibitors. But before we jump uh, deep into the technology and see some results, uh, Isabel, Isabel Martin Caballero, uh, our project advisor, will give us introduction to SETSA Explore itself. She did PhD in stem cell biology uh, at University of Edinburgh and later followed by diverse research positions in industry and academia working on epigenetics, sulfate decisions and IPS disease modeling. She joined Pelago as a scientist in 2017, but now she's working as project advisor. So without further ado, Isabel, stage is yours. Thank you, Jakob. Um, let's start with um, thinking why TETSA. So TETSA quantifies target engagement and measures compound binding to the protein target at the intended site of action. And TETSA does this in live cells without the need for modifying the target or the compound providing data that is both actionable and biologically relevant. And this can be done in all the stages of drug discovery pipeline. But what is TETSA? The cellular thermal shift assay is based on the biophysical principle that when a ligand, when a ligand binds a protein, it will change the thermal stability of that protein upon the heating so that when when we observe, when we are looking at the male curve of that protein, um, it will be a shift on that melt of that protein compared to the untreated sample. And this can be a stabilization, a stabilization effect when the protein remains stable at higher temperatures than the control, or a destabilization effect when the, pro when the protein in the treated sample is less stable than the control sample. So here we see a destabilization effect when the protein is less stable upon heat treatment than in the control sample. TETSA protocol includes three key steps. First, we treat the cells with a compound, and the cells can be many different cellular matrices. We have run many different projects with different cell lines, as well as primary cells, animal, bacteria, plant, 
yeast, fungi. After the compound incubation, uh, we have a heat treatment at different temperatures, and then we'll have a separation of the protein that has been denatured from the one that is still folded. Now, depending on what the question we want to answer, we will look at different ways of detection of that protein. If the question is what it has been targeted in case on a particular protein, then we will focus on targeted SETSA. In, in that case, we can look, for example, with antibodies in a Western blot, or we can look with a heavy isotope label a reference peptides for a particular protein in Navigate MS, or we can look with the dual detection antibodies for a plate format in high throughput. Now, if the question is which proteins are affected by my compound, then we are looking at protein white TETSA, TETS Explore, and that is what we are going to be discussing today. A bit more in detail. So here we have the same protocol. We incubate ourselves with or without the compound, and then we heat them at different temperatures, following by centrifugation to separate the soluble fraction. Then we prepare the samples for the mass spectrometry. And after that, we will detect about 7,000 proteins. And some of them will have a stabilization effect and some of them will have a destabilization effect. Now for the last three years or so, we have mainly been focused on the compressed format, which is also called PISA and one pot. The experiment have both compound concentration and temperature dimension. Then the samples that has been heated of the different temperatures between 40 and 62 degrees are then pooled per concentration. So we will obtain data from the area under the curve per compound concentration. Instead of the MEL curve, we will have compound concentration, the information from each compound concentration. And the data will be plotted in a volcano plot where we have uh, on the right hand side stabilizing, stabilized protein heats here in green, and in the left hand side destabilizing heats um, here in, in pink. And why we do the compressed format? Well, uh, we use less sample material, we have less running uh, time on the mass spec instrument. And it's also easier for automatization of the sample handling. Therefore, we can add more replicates in our samples, so we will have higher accuracy and better statistically ground. So in a cell, after compound treatment, majority of the proteins won't be affected by the compound but some of the proteins will, and these proteins will affect themselves downstream other proteins. For example, changes in phosphorylation, translocation, um, loss of interaction partner, and those will also change their thermal stability. These effects won't be seen in a lysate experiment, and this is something that is very powerful to compare both an experiment in an intact cell and the experiment in a lysate in Ted's Explore. Let's see one example. Here we are profiling a CDK9 inhibitor. And in the lysate experiment, we see a nice concentration response with high affinity for CDK9, as well as other kinases like GSK3 alpha and GSK3 beta. Um, and then on the, on the intact cell experiment, we do see also CDK9 in a concentration response manner and GSK3 alpha and GSK3 beta. But also we will see downstream effects of those proteins being affected. For example, we see a destabilization effect with a clear concentration response for FOXK1. 
So comparing the information from the license payment and the intact cell is useful to understand the mode of action of the, of the compound. Let's look at another CDK4, CDK6 inhibitor. Those inhibitors will downstream uh, affect a protein riboblastoma 1, and it will inhibit the phosphorylation of that protein. So we will be able to see downstream effect of those uh, particular proteins. Here we have an example with abemacyclic, palbocyclic, and ribocyclic. They are affecting CDK6. Uh, and then each compound has a different profile, which is very interesting to understand. My uh, uh, Thomas in the following uh, talk will be discussing this in much more detail. And here we can see an example for uh, palocyclic is affecting riboblastoma 1 as destabilization effect. And abemacyclic is also affecting RB1, but also we see GSK3 beta and GSK3 alpha, as it was the case for the CDK9 inhibitor. And then this is affecting FOXK1. So one idea is that possibly GSK3 is inhibiting GSK3 is affecting the equilibrium between FOXK1 in the cytoplasm, phosphorylated, and FOXK1 not phosphorylated in the nucleus. So understanding the molecular pathways and mode of action of the compound, it can be done through sex explore, comparing intact cell experiment, lysate experiment, and profiling different compounds. So that explore will give you the information of what happens in the cell after minutes and uh, within minutes of compound incubation. Then the phenotypic assay will give you the information of what happened in the cell after treatment during hours or days. If we put together this information with quantitative proteomics and post-translation post-translation and modification profiling, we will uh, have a very comprehensive compound profiling in relevant physiological conditions. So as Jacob was presenting, we are Pelago. Majority of our uh, projects are P4 service. We have other services like FD model and FEDSAN license as it's the case of our next speaker, Gizem from Bayer. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you so much, uh, Isabel, for the introduction to uh, Sets Explore and uh, also that uh, last slide on, uh, uh, on Pelago itself. So our next uh, speaker today uh, Gizem Akchai, she will uh, join us uh, virtually and will present um, a presentation titled SETSA Enable Deconvolution of Cellular Targets from a High Throughput Phenotypic Screen. So, hello, Gizem. Thank you so much for accepting the uh, invitation to be here with us tonight and presenting for, um, uh, for uh, our participants. Um, let's get your slides up on the screen and make sure everything is working. Um, and yeah, thank you time. so much again for, for joining us tonight. Um, thank you so much for the invite. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be part of this uh, technology webinar and happy to share our experience with the um, Pelago sets the techniques. Um, so let's see. Let's make this full screen. Okay, good. Yeah, um, so uh, today I will be um, sharing with you how we utilize uh, SETSA Explore platform for the convoluting protein targets um, of phenotypic hits uh, that we identified from uh, high throughput uh, cellular screens. Um, so, um, does this? Just making sure the control uh, bar doesn't block the. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, so I will start by uh, expanding here a little bit the definition of uh, phenotypic drug discovery. So uh, what is a phenotypic drug discovery? If you think about it, it is uh, really an unbiased um, chemical biology approach to identify novel mechanism of action that uh, complements traditional genetic dependency and target-based drug discovery approaches. And uh, phenotypic screening of small molecules in cancer cell lines is, in principle, a powerful approach to oncology drug discovery. Uh, but until recently, it has not been possible to do such screening at the uh, appropriate uh, scale. So um, our collaborators um, at uh, Broad Institute um, of MIT and Harvard have standardized uh, a new method uh, known as PRISM, uh, which is profiling relative inhibition simultaneously in um, mixtures, whereby all cell lines uh, are molecularly barcoded um, and then pulled together. Then these pools of uh, cancer uh, cells are treated with uh, small molecules, and then the abundance of the molecular barcodes are enumerated. So the PRISM method allows for uh, a parallel approach, uh, dramatically reducing the uh, cost and time required for uh, such a, a screen and making um, a relatively large scale cell based screening feasible. Um, so here is the Here is the overview of the PRISM screening workflow. Uh, we assembled a very unique screening deck of compounds representative of uh, the entire Bayer Library collection. The library was screened against hundreds of genetically uh, characterized cell lines, um, compounds that displayed cell line specific uh, killing profiles are then triaged uh, based on biomarker um, uh, relationships um, in addition to compound activity relative to uh, other perturbational data sets, uh, including a reference library of known uh, drugs and also functional genomics methods such as uh, SHRNA and CRISPR knockdown uh, screens. And uh, for hits that were uh, chemically attractive, uh, which displayed selective um, cell killing pro uh, profiles, which are distinct from known uh, anti cancer drugs um, with no clear mechanistic hypotheses, uh, we decided to deploy uh, such uh, MS-based uh, target deconvolution uh, studies. So we utilized um, state-of-the-art cellular uh, thermal shift assay platforms, uh, uh, which um, is available to us from our collaboration with Pelago, which is about very nicely uh, run through. So this essay has been introduced as a, a very powerful label-free method to assess target engagement in physiological environments. And it, uh, as uh, stated, is measuring target engagement based on the uh, compound-induced changes in protein stability and melting temperature. Uh, so the biggest advantage for us uh, of the protein white sets the MS is that it is label free. Simply the compound of interest is uh, incubated with the lysate or lifestyle that are relevant to the program and then followed by um, the uh, technical steps uh, to uh, obtain the soluble uh, protein fractions, which are then analyzed by um, mass spec. So in the end of the data analysis, uh, we do uh, uh, identify proteins uh, stabilized or destabilized upon treatment uh, with, uh, with the compound. Um, so the most advanced um, platform of the SETSA MS, um, which uh, again is about very nicely run through, uh, is the compressed SETSA MS format, uh, uh, also known as uh, one part. And in this case, uh, the live cells or lysates are treated with um, uh, dif different compound concentrations and then allocated with. Uh, uh, allocated together on a, a plate-based uh, format, um, and then the heat challenge and the rest of the steps are performed. Uh, so, you know, do uh, in in this um, 
in this uh, more uh, advanced uh, platform, the analytical high throughput is significantly increased uh, due to this uh, pooling step of uh, individual uh, sample and concentration points. Um, so we um, thought that this uh, compressed the MS platform was the most suitable um, uh, target deconvolution approach for uh, the analysis of prism heads uh, because it's uh, label free, so it didn't require any SDR knowledge, which we didn't have, and also due to the um, you know advanced analytical throughput compared to the um, previous versions. So um, next slide. Um, the the most striking result uh, from these studies uh, for us was identification of a common protein hit in both lysate and the lifestyle sets of MS uh, experiments for one of our high priority uh, prism hits, and um, this compound showed a significant uh, destabilization effect um, on a protein called OSPP shown here. Uh, which is actually an oxysterol binding protein, uh, which uh, functions as a lipid transporter protein between Golgi and uh, membranes of the ER. Um, so then uh, we have we um, conducted these experiments um, with optimized experimental setup, uh, and we reproducibly observed the profound effect of the compound uh, on OSPP, again, in both lysate and lifestyle treatment uh, conditions, which really uh, increased our confidence as uh, OSPP playing a um, role in the biology induced by this um, compound in cells. Um, so one nice feature of uh, the compressed sets MS format is that we can run enough concentration points uh, to curve fit and extract the target engagement potencies, PEC 50s, which is the concentration that um, uh, is needed for 50% protein stabilization or destabilization. So uh, we did see a very nice dose dependent uh, destabilization effect. Um, on OSBP uh, upon treatment with this compound and the low PEC 50s that we calculated were in line with uh, what we have seen in the PRISM data. Um, so uh, this was also very um, nice to see. Uh, next, uh, what we did was to um, set up um, sets and navigate experiments in order to validate uh, binding of the compound to the protein hits that we identified from the sets that explore uh, studies. So um, in um, you know targeted sets uh, navigate approach uh, after treatment and the heat shock, the soluble proteins uh, in this case are analyzed by Western blood uh, using a, a target specific antibody, in, in our case, OSBP specific antibody, and then the uh, quantification of the Western uh, blood allows you to uh, generate set some mouth curves and visualization of the mouth curve shift uh, if the compound is binding to the protein. Um, so here, um, when we uh, perform the sets and navigate experiments in the lysates uh, with compound one, we were very pleased to see a clear uh, destabilization effect um, upon treatment with compound one. Uh, and as you can see in uh, the plot here, a very nice shift, um, left, left shift of the uh, mouth curve, uh, sorry, right, uh, left shift of the mouth curve compared to the DMSO control. So this result uh, validated uh, binding of uh, compound one to cellular uh, OSBP. Um, and then um, we, um, and then we also looked at a, a structurally close analog um, of uh, this uh, hit compound one. And um, this, uh, given there is a high prism correlation between compound one and structurally close analog compound two, we expected that these two compounds share a common cell killing mechanism. And when we performed a targeted sessor experiment with the analog two, we again see uh, the same destabilization effect um, on OSBP. 
uh, and uh, when we use a, a structurally unrelated compound, again, a different prism hit, we didn't see any OSBP effect. So this uh, suggested that the SEFSA effect was specific to uh, this um, compound cluster. Um, so um, it turns out that there are a number of OSBP uh, inhibitors uh, or modulators uh, reported in, uh, in literature, and one of them is actually a natural product, OSW1. Um, this compound uh, binds to OSBP uh, with uh, nanomolar affinities. And um, what we found out that the cell lines that were uh, sensitive to um, uh, OSBP inhibition by OSW1 in the NCI60 data uh, were also sensitive to uh, our compound one and it's um, analog two uh, in the um, um, in the prism data sets and that's uh, supported the role of uh, OSBP in the cycling activity of these compounds. Um, then we also um, Perform the targeted uh, OSPP sets the experiments uh, with the two compound OSW1, uh, and we indeed showed again the destabilization of OSPP, uh, which was uh, similar to the uh, prism hit uh, compound one. Um, and um, prism profiling of uh, OSW1, the two compound, uh, also showed that the impact of uh, OSW1 um, on viability across uh, cell lines is correlated to response to compound one. So this again strengthened our hypothesis that um, the cell killing activity of compound one uh, is uh, related to OSPP similar to the two compound OSW1. Um, so However, when we did a combination experiments or rescue experiments with uh, compound one and OSW1, uh, we did not see a rescue effect on the impact of compound one on proliferation. Um, however, a recent publication describes another target for OSW1, let's say a co-target for OSW1, which uh, is uh, responsible for its anti-proliferative effect. So uh, perhaps uh, that might be why we haven't observed the rescue effect with this OSBP um, modulator. Um, However, when we performed a, a rescue experiment with another reported OSPP inhibitor, TTP8307, um, um, we were able to see a nice um, rescue uh, effect um, on, uh, so the TTP8307 rescued the impact of compound one um, on proliferation, which suggested that OSPP at least partially is responsible for the effect of a compound one on the uh, cell killing, um, on the uh, cell line viability. Um, so then uh, we, we also have a lot of, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, functional genomics data, CRISPR knockout and uh, shRNA data for all these um, uh, cell lines that were part of the PRISM screening. So um, when we um, looked at this um, cr uh, CRISPR correlation data, so we analyzed the CRISPR uh, knockout data, uh, for prism cell lines and compared uh, that to the viability phenotype induced by OSW1 and also the prism hit compound one, um, we observed a strong correlation with OSBP uh, and also another protein PI4KB, uh, PI4KB correlation actually stronger. So this, uh, this observation uh, led us to um, come up with uh, a mechanistic hypothesis for um, for um, how this compound uh, might be um, acting acting in the uh, cell lines of interest. So um, OSPP, as I mentioned very early on, is, uh, is a protein that has a role in cholesterol transport between uh, ER and the Golgi. And this function is um, uh, coupled to uh, hydrolysis of uh, inostudial uh, phosphate, uh, 4 phosphatase, um, in short PI4P. So uh, 
PI4KB, that we saw a strong uh, correlation with its knockout, is actually providing PI4P to OSPP to regulate this cholesterol shuttling process. So based on this um, you know, strong correlation between the antiproliferative effect um, of a compound one and OSW1 to the PI4KB loss of function phenotype, in addition to all the SETSA data that confirms OSBP uh, engagement, um, our hypothesis is that the compound binds to uh, OSBP and blocks the transport of uh, PI4, PI4P. Um, and uh, currently, we are uh, performing additional uh, functional studies to uh, validate um, our hypothesis. So, um, uh, in summary, by taking a uh, multi-omic approach uh, and integrating functional genomics data um, and um, uh, comparing that uh, and integrating that to uh, set the MS-based proteomic studies um, and also using bioinformatics tools, uh, we were able to uh, uncover a potentially novel um, uh, cancer target and uh, develop a mechanistic understanding to the uh, observed um, viability phenotype uh, of the um, a high throughput phenotypic screening hits uh, in cancer cells. Um, yeah, so with that, I would like to thank um, the team members who were um, involved in this uh, project uh, from uh, both broad side and bare side, in addition to um, our collaboration partners, Alexia and Isabel, for their, for their continuous uh, support. Um, uh, be it be technical or more general um, questions related to set stability of uh, different protein classes. So that was really helpful. Um, so yeah, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you uh, all attendees and also Pelago team for the invite. And uh, yeah, happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gizem, for your presentation. And uh, it would be great if you can stay with us to the end of the webinar to answer uh, questions from uh, participants. I already saw that we have a couple of them coming to uh, our our chat. So please stay with us till the, till the end. And we'll keep that Q&A uh, towards the end of the, of the webinar. So thank you so much again for uh, joining us and, and giving that great presentation. You're our welcome. Next <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, our next speaker then uh, will be Thomas Freeman, and he will be focusing uh, today um, on um, profiling HDAC inhibitors with SETSA uh, Explore. So I'll just bring up the slides for him. All right, presentation is on, and then we just miss our speaker. So Thomas, stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. And also, thank you, Isabel and Gizem, for your previous presentations. May I will make mine easier because I can skip the intro. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about uh, a brief little talk about histone deacetylase inhibitors. And this work is part of a uh, larger project that we have here at Pelago, where we are, which we call the Target Engagement Atlas. Uh, which is an effort we do to uh, screen uh, compounds to kind of build a reference library for ourselves so we know what uh, uh, to compare on compounds that we haven't seen before. That will also help us a bit in doing target convolution for our customers. Uh, so the focus on this project was to uh, screen as many compounds as possible uh, in the SETSA compressed SETSA MS format. Uh, so we had to set certain boundaries. So we only use one cell line, the HG2 cell line, and intact cells. Uh, all incubation has been, uh, compound incubations has been for one hour, and we use a single compound concentration of 30 micromolar. And this is what helps us uh, uh, increase the number of compounds because we only use one concentration. Uh, we do this in biological triplicates in order to get reproducibility. 
And of course, we have a negative uh, control, but we also include positive controls as bridging samples. And these positive controls are vincristine and methotrexate. And that is because they uh, give us very uh, robust uh, and reproducible uh, sets of MS profiles. And to date, we have approximately 350 uh, compounds uh, profiled, and these range from approved uh, drugs to uh, probes. And each compound utilizes around six hours of uh, machine time on the MS machines. So today's talk is going to be about histone deacetylase inhibitors. But first, I will just uh, give you a brief background on what the uh, histone deacetylases are. And these are a group of enzymes that are capable of removing acetyl groups from proteins. And this is primarily histones. But also non-histone proteins can be uh, deacetylated by uh, HDACs. Uh, and there are four classes of HDACs. Um, where class one and two, uh, and two has a subdivision of A and B, uh, are kind of the common uh, HDACs, whereas the class three uh, are called sirtuins, and class four uh, only consists of uh, HDAC 11. Uh, so what does then uh, histone deacetylase, what, what are the effect on cell physiology? So uh, Chromatin, uh, which is mainly histones and other proteins on which DNA is uh, wrapped up around, uh, it, it has two conformations, or uh, one can roughly say two conformations, uh, a closed conformation and an open conformation. And acetylation uh, helps uh, keeping chromatin in the open, or acetylation of histones helps keeping the chromatin in an open uh, conformation, which allows for transcription. And the role of HDAX is to remove the acetylations and that will favor the closed chromatin uh, configuration. So HDAC inhibitors will then stop the uh, action of HDAX and keep the chromatin open and transcription can then ensue. Uh, and the net effect of keeping uh, the chromatin open and keeping transcription on is actually that the cell go into a uh, cell cycle arrest apoptosis, but also differentiation. And these are features that are favorable if one wants to treat tumors, which uh, <clears throat> then has unlimited uh, proliferation. So, and that is the role of HDAC inhibitors, is uh, mainly to be used uh, as treatment against uh, malignant diseases like tumors and cancers. Uh, and the role uh, in, uh, uh, or in, it's not only histones that uh, has a role in this uh, phenotype of HDAC inhibitors. It can also be non-histone proteins that uh, uh, whose acetylation can be regulated in order to uh, achieve this end goal of uh, cell cycle arrest and apoptosis. Uh, so. In this study, we have investigated uh, 11 uh, reported or suggested HDAC inhibitors. The largest group are the hydroxamate group, uh, which contain panabinostat and burinostat, which is the approved, uh, two of the approved compounds. Uh, we also have uh, valproic acid, which represents the short chain fatty acid uh, type. Uh, um, valproic acid is also a proof compound, but not as a HDAC inhibitor, but as an anticonvalescent. And then we also have benzimid, uh, uh, type represented by antinostat, and we also have uh, thiomyristoyl and curcumin. Uh, so, as you can see here, so this is a focus on the class uh, one and class two uh, HDACs. And we can, in HEP2 cells, we can detect uh, uh, all of these uh, class one and class two, except HDEC9, which we couldn't get a reproducible detection of. Uh, as one can see here, we have a valproic acid or curcumin is, are not able to uh, shift any of the HDACs. Uh, the hydroxamate type uh, HDAC, droxinostat, only uh, shifts HDEC6. Uh, but most uh, of the compounds uh, affect HDAC uh, of 
uh, both class one and class two. And Belinostat uh, is the most promiscuous one, which affects uh, seven out of nine detected HDACs. If we look into this example, or two examples, we have Borinostat and we have Belinostat. And Belinostat was the one that affected most HDACs. And both of them uh, affect HDACs of uh, class one and class two. But the, the biggest difference here is the amount of non HDAC proteins that are shifted by Belinostat, even though they uh, share some of these non HDAC shifters. And, and the one most intriguing here is the LAP3, which is the most statistically significant shift in Belinostat, uh, whereas it has a very low, uh, or uh, not very low, but a lower significance in uh, with uh, Borinostat. So if we focus a bit on uh, not only the HDAC proteins, but uh, the non-HDAC proteins that are also uh, shifted by uh, these compounds, we can see that the benzamid type uh, and tenostat is uh, not as it's not affecting these proteins to the same degree as the hydroxamate type um, HDAC inhibitors. So what we're looking here, uh, looking at here, is uh, uh, then shifted proteins. So red are destabilized proteins and blue are stabilized. And in the destabilized cluster, we find proteins like BRD3, which are chromatin. Uh, all of these proteins are chromatin or HDAC interacting proteins. Uh, so they can clearly be part of the pathway when you inhibit the HDACs. Uh, we also see some of these proteins when we uh, look at the stabilized proteins. But some of these has no annotation that to be connected to either chromatin or uh, HDACs. And here again, we have the LAP3, which is a cytosol amino peptidase. Uh, but this protein, even though it has no annotation to be connected to HDACs or chromatin, it is actually reported to have acetylated lysines. So this one can speculate that this uh, LAP3 is actually a uh, substrates for an HDAC and that this uh, is inhibited by uh, uh, treating with HDAC inhibitors. And it's quite striking looking at uh, 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 proteins or compounds that shift uh, LAP3 and the most prominent shifters here are uh, HDAC inhibitors of the hydroxamate class. So uh, it, that is also something that Tells me, uh, tells us that uh, they might be uh, bound to this class of inhibitors that uh, do this. You can see this uh, lab tree is also shifted by uh, other compounds than um, HDAC inhibitors, but the HDAC inhibitors are the most prominent ones. And then I'm just gonna uh, round off with the talking about the only class three inhibitor we have profiled. And this uh, is quite striking. It's uh, one of the most selective compounds I have seen uh, when looking at these 350 uh, sets of MS profiles. So this one is reported to be a selective SERP2 inhibitor. And I say, indeed, it is very, very selective. Uh, it's not often you come across uh, such a selective probe. So just to round off, uh, so we can show here that the um, sets of MS, uh, even though we use, use one uh, concentration, uh, 30 micromolar, can be used to assess specificity if you have uh, a larger set of compounds. Uh, we can see here that hydroxamate type HDAC inhibitors, they affect both class one and class two HDACs as indicated. And antinostat, the benzamide type HDAC inhibitor, only shifts class 1 HDAC, also as has been previously reported. It also seems like antinostat has uh, less uh, non HDAC protein shifters compared to the hydroxamide type HDAC inhibitors in general. Uh, we didn't see any shift of HDAC for the suggested HDAC inhibitors, valproic acid and curcumin. Uh, cytosol amino peptidase or LAP3 uh, were shifted by all hydroxamate uh, HDAC inhibitors, uh, with the exception of tricostatin A, which did not uh, show any um, um, uh, shift of uh, LAP3. 
So, and we couldn't detect any compounds that could shift HDAC3 or HDAC5. And the final, the only uh, sertraline inhibitor, uh, thiomaristol, was uh, indeed very, proved to be a very, very uh, selective uh, probe for, uh, for that protein. Okay, thank you very much. All right, Thomas, thank you so much for your presentation. And I would like to invite you to stay here with me actually uh, on, uh, on the stage, uh, because now it will be a time for uh, our um, uh, Q&A session. So I'll just stop showing the screen and bring up everyone uh, in the room. And also Gizem, I'll ask you to join us in that um, question and answer uh, session. All right, perfect. So you can see hopefully uh, all of us here in uh, Stockholm, but also Gizem on the other side uh, of the ocean. So uh, we already have a couple of questions in our uh, chat. I will start with the first one and it um, reads like this. Do we need to perform both lysate and lysels in order to obtain uh, the valid result? And I think I would like to direct that one to you, Gizem, because I think that came uh, during the middle of, of your presentation. What is what is your view on, on that? Yeah, that's a question that is asked uh, a lot of times. Uh, but yeah, from our experience uh, running uh, them both at the same time with the same cell line in lysates and lifestyles uh, give you know, the most uh, in-depth information you can, um, that really helped us to identify uh, true hits from um, non-true hits. Uh, well, in this experiment, it was a bit more straightforward because the OSPP as a target really stood out of the rest. But in other uh, case studies, we have, you know, running them in parallel really was helpful for us to um, find, you know, uh, narrow down the list of uh, relevant proteins. Great, thank you. Um, anything uh, from us to, to add to, to that? Oh, I would say I agree. Uh, doing both intact and lysit is, is always better when, when doing target evolution. Yeah, definitely brings uh, additional value to, to the data set. And, um, a uh, follow-up question to this is, um, is it reasonable to incubate the lysate uh, or cells with a high compound concentrations on cells explored where the selectivity index of that compound is relatively low? Um, and I think uh, probably you, Thomas, uh, observed that different uh, you know, selectivity profiles uh, and then probably there is also a concentration uh, relationship with, with that. How do you see this problem? Yeah, so I mean, from from the perspective of uh, what I presented, we do one concentration, and that's like try to do a constant one concentration fit all, just to get the uh, because uh, we don't know so much uh, to get like a, a proper uh, saturation. Uh, so, but always, if one want to do a proper target convolution, then I think we should always do a concentration response effort. So I think it could be good to have them in comparable but uh, uh, concentrations uh, in both intact and lysate. But um, I mean, it depends on how many points you have. Uh, in, you can always go lower in lysate, but it should be some uh, overlapping between intact and lysate. Kizem, did you do you have any experience with with uh, you know selectivity? Uh, being changed with, with different concentrations of the compounds analyzed with, with sets explore? Um, yeah, so that is why we really like the compressed format where we can uh, look into multiple doses. Uh, yeah, when you have um, higher compound concentration, it is possible that sometimes you know you see additional targets, but that's really uh, helpful in de-risking the uh, compound, uh, you know, to see if there are other potential core targets or off targets that are popping off. Uh, so I think uh, I agree that we uh, one could, uh, you know, if it's, um, you know, a screen that's going to be followed by a, a dose response screen, it makes sense to start with one dose, but then definitely looking at multiple doses should be incorporated in the screen or in the study to uh, better understand the um, target profile. 
Great, thank you. The next question uh, is, do you see any bias towards certain proteins in sets? Uh, I'm wondering if some proteins may exhibit reversible uh, folding, unfolding, and therefore may not aggregate at elevated uh, temperatures. Um, any comments uh, on this, uh, um, Isabel? <laughs> What have you seen in the uh, target engagement atlas? Yeah, I mean, for sure, there are, uh, there, there are, of course, technical biases, uh, both uh, uh, for the method that we, the, the method has certain proteins called, pre we can call them frequent shifters, that uh, seems to be uh, easily shiftable uh, by a lot of compounds, but they usually shift at that quite high concentration, we're talking about uh, double digit micromolars uh, when we see these uh, proteins shift. But then also we have the, the bias of the mass spec uh, that certain proteins are, are uh, favored or certain peptides are, are favored by the, by the mass spec. So, yeah. so, so yes, there, I think all techniques has a bias to some extent. Great, thank you. And then uh, the next question is about uh, controls. When testing novel compounds for target deconvolution, what compounds do you recommend to test additionally active and non-active analogs or any other controls? That's the first part of this question. Yeah, we, we have seen many different projects uh, running quite successfully with um, an inactive analog um, compared. But also sometimes those can also have a, also a binding effects as well. Uh, and that can be good to compare uh, the same way as we are comparing intact cell and lines that you can compare also um, in, uh, two different chemical series that have a similar phenotypic effect, for example, or you can have um, one uh, component uh, inactive analog and compare their profiles. That can be quite useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that, Isabel. And uh, next uh, question uh, from the same user is, can you elaborate, and that's to you, Thomas, on how your target engagement atlas will help to analyze data for novel compounds? Uh, so, it so it gives us what the known compounds are doing that we can uh, backtrack mode of action. So if we get an uh, unknown compound, then we can see what else has been shifted uh, uh, by uh, or what else has shifted the same proteins that we see with the uh, unknown compound. So that is what kind of helps us elucidate uh, kind of a mode of action. Uh, and also um, uh, of target binding and so on. It's kind of generating those fingerprints and yeah. trying to, to match if they look similar, right? Yeah. And the next question is, if we do not uh, know the targets of the compound, will we get a list of frequent shifters so that we can eliminate those? Is that something that we routinely do? Yeah, I would say that's one of the, one of the like, good things with, when we have the target engagement atlas, we have a quite good view about what are the uh, typical frequent shifters. And so we we kind of know that, and I mean we will always uh, report on uh, uh, on that when we do target deconvolution that uh, these might be uh, frequent shifter. Usually, you you see these things. Uh, depending, I mean. If we do multiple doses, we most often do in a target deconvolution study. You see that these proteins usually show up uh, at the higher concentrations. Great. Thank you. And the uh, uh, next question is more about the uh, limits of, of uh, SETSA uh, technology. How well does SETSA work for membrane-bound uh, proteins? Uh, what is your view on that, Isabel? Yes. Yeah, so... Definitely membrane-bound proteins for that's explored in an unbiased method uh, without changing any parameters for, for the assay, it can be a um, difficulty. So it's um, depending on the question that you want to answer, uh, whether you want to bias the experiment 
adding some detergents to um, solubilize the proteins and detect them better, but uh, taking um, the objective of thinking that that might make the pro other proteins uh, less, uh, you might not see six for other proteins uh, if you are adding detergents. So I guess the depending on the question you want to answer, we can um, advise you on what can be the best uh, setup for the experiment. Great. Uh, Gizem, I wanted to also ask you a question about uh, your, your primary hit, but also I was wondering if you looked at, at more pathway-related um, um, landscape in, in the sets explore. I know that you correlated data with the uh, with some some other experiments looking more into into uh, the pathway itself, but did you also observe something like this in in this explore data set? Yeah, <clears throat> so what what we are doing now is really um, expanding the cell line panel. So we uh, selected a um, couple of cell lines that are very sensitive, medium sensitive, and then not sensitive, and we are performing live cell. Uh, sets of explore experiments with that to be able to really get that uh, you know more biology mechanistic information of what other proteins pop up uh, in the sensitive cell lines versus insensitive so that we can dial down uh, to more mechanistic um, uh, aspects of of this study. Great, thank you. Uh, I think we have time for last uh, question, and uh, that's uh, from our chat. Is the lack of the effect against Ajax with alproic acid and curcumin related to their weak affinity for the putative targets? Uh, were there other proteins identified but these compounds? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, when it comes to valproic acid, you could actually see hits that uh, were. Um, uh, you can see hits that were chromatin associated, uh, also associated the RNA polymerase too. So, in for for uh, valproic acid, I would say that they could be. You can probably get the same phenotype. Uh, maybe it's an indirect effect on on the HDAX. For curcumin, we did not see any anything that would would suggest an effect on chromatin reorganization or chromatin organization uh, at all. So, yeah, I mean, the data at hand suggests that there is no actual binding, at least not uh, what we can detect. Uh, so, yeah, I've seen affinity uh, figures at least for curcumin, and it's not that impressive. So, I think it's. Uh, this study has confirmed what, what's in the literature. Great. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Gizem, for uh, presenting, uh, joining us today and uh, participating in this uh, really nice uh, discussion. Thank you to all participants for tuning in to uh, today's webinar and taking active part in the discussion as well, asking uh, the questions. I really uh, appreciate this. Um, and just to let you know, if you like uh, content like this, please follow us on our LinkedIn page, uh, Pelago Bioscience, where we will advertise more webinars like this. If you have suggestions, what else would you like to listen to? Please uh, let us know there as well. You can always contact us at our email contact at pelagobio.com and visit our website, pelagobioscience.com to read more about uh, SETSA, reach out to our project advisors, uh, to get uh, specific advice on your product. So thank you again so much for tuning in. Thank you for staying here with me for the question and answers. Thank you, Gizem, for joining us virtually for this uh, webinar. And thank you for uh, listening in. Thank you and bye, everyone. <laughs>